Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, baby? What's cracking? Oh, What's nothing, crying? man. Welcome to the show, man. It's all good. Listen, uh, it's an let, honor to have you on the show, sir. Oh yeah, it's an honor to have you on the show, man. Uh, uh, that's my that's my co-host, Black Bama, right there. Yeah, it's all good, fam, for sure. Well, well, check this out, man. I listen. First of all, man, uh, you know you you uh, back in the day, man. You was my dude, man. You was my dude. I I got. I want to share something with you. I remember we watched uh, we watched uh, Minister uh, uh, Minister Society. And man, we was right. so we was so geeked up after that movie, man. We were some knuckleheads back in the day, man. We was <laughs> we was so we was so geeked up after the movie, the A Wax. We was just big A Wax fans, man. We we jumped in the car. We had a fake ass shotgun, and we was rolling. <laughs> we was rolling around, you know, hanging out the car, just daring people to to you know say something to us so we can roll up right. so we can roll up on them like yo homie let me help you out with that bam bam <laughs> that's right that's that official yeah that's that official man so let you know what let, let's just jump right into that man let, let talk about um talk about uh, how you got the role in the uh in the minister society and and what and what it was like to do the movie well, shit, you know, basically, you know, I'd, uh, I'd been recording Conscious Most Wanted, doing my thing, putting out albums. Um, it's a constant thing, straight checking on music to drive by. And, um, you know, these cats, young cats out of the, out of Pomona or whatever in the, in the city, uh, you know, the movie scene was getting a little popular as far as, you know, trying to, to pick tales from the hoods. And, uh, you know, what dudes were seeing that was going on as far as, you know, uh, the, the, the mishaps as far as you want to concern is what was going down in the neighborhood. So we had, you know, uh, colors and then we had boys in the hood. So these two young cats, the hood, the, the huge brothers, uh, was putting together this movie for New Line Cinema. You know, huge brothers was well known for working with Tupac, doing a lot of Tupac videos. So they got a deal to do these movies. So I guess they basically wanted some, you know, some street appeal as far as hip hop was concerned. Because like I said, hip hop had started, you know, presenting themselves in the movie roles, whatever, Cube and Tupac, whatever. So um, they just basically hit my management up and said they wanted me to come down and read for this part. So, you know, me being just a uh, true hip-hop dude, you know, whatever, I really didn't think nothing of it. And then basically my ass was still in the streets as well. So I wasn't looking at it as no big thing. You know, I was just rapping or whatever. So they uh, presented me with a script, you know. One thing about it is even though I was from the streets, you know, uh, moms kept a nigga. Moms was always on the nigga ass for education. So... I could read and shit, you know. So <laughs> I, I I was able to read the script they gave me. I was able to remember lines and shit like that. So they offered me the part, and you know the rest is history. One of the cultural icon movies that you know presented itself as far as what dudes was going through growing up in the neighborhoods, and you know having to take that role as far as you know, being gang members or selling drugs or whatever. So that's basically how I fell into the role of ministry society. And like I said, on the aspect that I was still myself hanging in the streets and in the neighborhoods at the time, even though I still had three albums out, I I wasn't, I was still a, a, a boy stuck in the hood, so to speak. So I, I was able to bring some of that, that hood element to the table as far as the movie was concerned. You know what? That was the uh, that was the feeling that I got too, man. You know, you struck me as a real dude, man. I was like, this the cat. This dude is about it. He really about it. And uh, you struck me as a dude that was really doing. It wasn't no studio gangster in you at all, man. I, I got that feeling from you, I, man. And I grew up in the neighborhood, you know, gang bang, sold drugs. I did all that shit. So I wasn't a cat who just basically just tried to go to the studio and just write about, you know, what other cats was doing. 
I live this shit every day, you know, growing up in Compton, single mother household, me, my sister, my little brother. So, you know, before rap came along, it was it was the gang, it was neighborhood and some gang bang. So mm. it was just at the it was just at the fortunate time that when I got into gang banging and selling drugs, that rap presented itself. Right. So a, a, a kid like myself who you know, mother was educated. My father worked at General Motors. My mother was like a nurse and all that type of shit. So I had some fit, so to speak. Right, right. So when when rap presented itself, it gave me the opportunity to go, okay, instead of t- and me taking a penitentiary chance or keep trying to sell drugs or whatever, I just took it up to start making raps about the neighborhood and what I was going through every day and what the homies was going through or, you know, the enemy shit and all that type of stuff. So it gave me the clear vision to put my words or my expressions down on paper and turn them into songs. But I was still a, I was still a, I was still a nigga stuck in the hood, so to speak. I still wanted to go to the neighborhood every day. I still wanted to low ride. I still wanted to hang on the corner. I still wanted to ride around with pistols in my car and shit like that. So I didn't get out of that shit until, I don't know, maybe I was about 25 years old. But my first three albums, I was still in the neighborhood every day. You know, I'd go on tour. I'd go on tour, come off of tours, you know, meetings with big corporate motherfuckers. As soon as I get back home, I'm jumping in my car and going right back to the neighborhood. Is that an addictive life? Is that because I know a lot of brothers try to get out of that, you know, because they tired looking over their shoulder or something like that. But you, 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 you depict you are presented as a different side. That's actually an addiction to that life. Would you say that? I mean, it's what we knew. I mean, shit. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's just like when kids go off to college, they play sports or whatever, whatever. And then when they get on vacation, they go back to the neighborhood or where they right. grew up from. Right. For for me, Compton and the gang banging neighborhood shit, from the time I knew what life was or the meaning or whatever, mm. I was in the neighborhood. So it felt regular for me to travel the country go on tour, and then wow. go on the tour bus and go right back to the neighborhood. Because it's God where I grew up. It's where I grew up. It's where my mom lived. It's where my sisters was, my cousin, all my friends, you know. Right. I didn't have the choice of going at that time, okay, I'm getting off tour. I'm going to jump, jump in my car and ride to Hollywood Hills or whatever, whatever. I, 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 didn't, I didn't take that role. I took the role like... To be, a, to be official, you still had to represent where you was from and whatever. So right. yeah, oh, you see me on it. you see me on you see me on videos and all that shit. And when you see me on the regular day, you see me riding through Compton. Right. You don't see me in Beverly Hills or Hollywood or the fancy restaurant right. or whatever. Right. You see me at the burger stand around the corner with the homies still pulling up until it got to a point to where. You know, it got to a point to where it was like, okay, you can't come around here anymore. It got to that point. Right. Mm. When when you start doing movies and you're pulling up in hundred thousand dollar cars and you got Rolex watches on and shit like that. To me, to me, I was like, I'm still a part. Right. <laughs> to, those, to, to the to the other niggas, it was like. Oh no, nigga! You out of you, you out of place now. You have no mm, reason. Right. You have no reason to be around here. Some of it was good rhetoric of telling me, "Hey, my nigga," so, and then some of it was pure hate as far as don't bring your ass around here right. or or right. something might happen. Always got that. You start se- you start separating yourself from the regular nigga, and even though you still consider yourself regular, mm-hmm. other niggas don't. Because, like I said, while they still stuck in the hood every day and s- s- struggling, selling drugs and whatever, you pulling up at hundred thousand dollar cars without a care in the world and 
knowing you can pay your bills tomorrow, your kids got on fancy shoes and shit like that, you start separating yourself from the true struggle. And it's one of the reasons why I still make the music I do, because I like people to know that there is still a struggle and everything ain't motherfucking rose. Right, right. You know, you know, one of the things that surprised me when I was getting ready for the interview, I was looking at a couple interviews and you said, yo, 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 yo influences was East Coast. That that surprised me. That surprised me like hell. I was like, as gangster as you are. Well, we, didn't have, we didn't have rap on the West Coast. Our rap was corny. We had corny fucking rap on the West Coast. <laughs> so we had niggas like fucking the Wrecking Crew and Bobby Jimmy and the Kickers <laughs> and shit like that. We didn't, we didn't have significant rap. Our significant rap was East Coast. I mean, that was everybody rap. If you was a hip-hop head and you go back as far as I did, then rap started on the East Coast. Right. It started with Run DMC. And then niggas listened to Beastie Boys. And we listened to UTFO and Roxanne Shante. And we listened to Kumo D and LL right. Right. and shit like that. We didn't have that on the West Coast. You didn't have that shit nowhere. I mean, Miami had a little bass sound. I used to listen to MC Shy D and right. shit like that. I used to go way back with music. I used to listen to MC Shy D from down in Florida and you know, but mainly hip hop was East Coast. You right. Get me? So we didn't have that. We didn't have our we didn't have our fucking symbolization of being West Coast rappers. We didn't have that until niggas like Toddy T came along. Right. When Toddy T came along, him and Mixmaster stayed, they came along and they started making street music. Basically, they was neighborhood niggas from neighborhoods. Toddy T actually was from the same neighborhood I was from. Toddy T came out with the Batarang because they started, they were regular niggas selling shit in the hood and used to get raided and bat around and police and all that. So Todd started putting that on TV tape tapes. And he starts selling tapes to niggas from different neighborhoods, rapping about what was going on in your neighborhood that day. Man, that is interesting because, you know, it's interesting you say that because you guys, the West Coast changed rap. When gangster rap came in, you guys changed it. Exactly. Okay, you they might have started it, but you guys evolved it. Well, right, for, because what? we our our rap basically was struggle. Everything we rapped about, where you minus the few West, you minus a few West Coast artists who were just strictly music and having fun and making. But most of West Coast rap was built on the struggle of. Happen to be gang banging, selling drugs. Yeah, bullshit. yeah, yeah. And, you know, we took rap from having a good time to like we were the West Coast basically version of I. I don't want to clarify like that, but Public Enemy is where you started seeing that rap was more than just hey party, have fun. Right, right, you know, right. I'm, 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 I'm the baddest right. dude on the mic, and I'm the baddest this, and I'm the... Public Enemy took you to a point where, goddamn, motherfuckers can really talk. It's some real shit going on. Right. It's a voice. Had, they were right. a voice, a platform. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what basically we started doing with what we had. Gotcha. NWA, Easy, Compton's Most Wanted, uh, Ice Cube, King Ice Cube. We started building our platform by basically going, you guys want to know about why we wear colors. Y'all want to know about why we say cooking blood. Y'all want to know about why it's drive-by killings and all that. So thus, you started having dudes like Toddy T, Mixed Maps of Spade. Then came Easy. Then came NWA and just the, the, the ricochet effect. Because all our, all our shit was built off of, hey, I'm a nigga in the hood every day saying, trying to sell drugs to feed my kids, buy pampers, or whatever the case may be. And then I got police harassment. Then I got niggas from across the train tracks who are trying to kill me because I represent this neighborhood over here. So I'm going to put all that shit in the record, and I'm going to start letting you people know in America, 
this is what we go through as far as West Coast is concerned. And yeah, now, yeah, it, that it blew me away. It, it actually blew me away. I, I remember, you know, like I said, we I was raised like like you said, I was raised on the East Coast music, and then right. when when the West Coast start reporting, you know what was going on in their neighborhoods, you know the drive by shootings. I remember, I remember when I watched Minister Society, I actually left there like, damn, that shit go on there. I actually left there like, yeah, I yes. left, I left there fucked up like, damn, that shit. They that's that's life. They they really got. They got that shit to worry it about. Was frightening. So uh, it was shocking to us. It was fright. It was frightening because we had never seen. We you know we knew it went on, but for you the guys to put it in the perspective that you did, it was shocking. It was almost, It was frightening but, to us. I mean, it was, but I loved it though. I this, but, but I loved it. I got into it. I loved it, man. Hey, it it became. It became my life. I'm, a, I'm not going to lie. When I was major, around, ma- major, I was major, ma- to major, me. major, bring it down a little bit, man. You're talking too loud, man. Bring it down a little bit. <laughs> oh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, pee. Okay. Bring, bring it down. Bring it down. I want to ask you about something, oh. man. You know what? Man, they, people thought that your, your gang, your album was so gangster. They gave you a double sticker. Is that true? Right. You, you got a double. Yes, what, what, what is a double sticker? Basically, they were putting parental advisory stickers on the records back then. Mm. Basically, if you had a record like mine or any record with profanity or saying bitch or hoe or fuck this or whatever, you got a parental advisory sticker. Okay. At this time, Warner Brothers was going through a big-ass riff with with uh, Body Count because Ice-T had a right. cop killer. Right. Okay, and at the same time, Warner Atlantic, all, Warner Electric Atlanta, which was we at the time, they were all connected. Thus, you had Interscope, who was dealing with Death Row. Right. So now you got the whole, you got Ice T with Body Count going fuck, going cop killer. Right. You got Interscope with Death Row screaming fuck bitches, money over bitches, bitches ain't shit. <laughs> so, everybody started wanting to distance themselves from that type of material. Motherfuckers started getting scared. Oh my God, oh, here comes, you know, Dukakis and, you know, Dolores Tucker and all these motherfuckers started going, fuck this type of music. So, record labels started getting scared. So, what Sony did at the time because my record was getting ready to drop, We Come Strapped, which I had just got through film in Minister Society, blah, blah, blah. So they knew it was going to be a large record. Platinum, so, p- platinum album, platinum. Right, so they didn't want no slack for it being an MC8 record, because we already know MC8 going to be going, fuck this, fuck <laughs> that, fuck you, shoot up a motherfucker, we don't give a fuck. Fuck the white man, honky, honky. <laughs> they already knew it. So because they had already heard the record. So in other so in other words in other words, your shit was so gangster they had to put two stickers on that bitch. <laughs> they, put a, they put a sec they put a second sticker basically saying the views of this artist are not ours. <laughs> that is hilarious. Basically so even though <laughs> he released his record and we're putting it out. This is his soul. This is his soul expression. It has nothing to do with anyone at Sony Music. So, and that's the and that's the sticker they put on the front of the record. It was the first record to ever have a double sticker. But those parental advisory stickers. How would I sound? How would I sound? Matter of fact, I took off my earpiece. Uh, it sounds a little oh, bit better. Did. Sounds sound a little bit better. Okay. I want to ask you about one. Of, I want to ask you about one of my favorite songs, man. It's it's a Compton thing. That's that's one of my favorite songs. That was the song. That was the first song that I ever heard from you. It's a Compton thing, man. Talk about talk about the meaning of that song and 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 why you made that song. Uh, it's a Compton thing was basically my first record, and you know Compton was you know getting out there and you know Compton was becoming real popular as far as Easy and W.A. was concerned everything was Compton people wanted to know so I just felt naming my album it's the Compton thing 
and coming out with the with a title track to the to that song was basically just trying to let people see or listen or hear what Compton was about as far as outside of what you were hearing being told by the media or Easy or NWA. I wanted to give my side and perspective of what I thought about what growing up in Compton was to me. So that's why I came out with the title track, It's a Compton Thing, and named the record that. Did, D, did DJ Slip that. Did, did, did DJ Slip do that beat? DJ Slip, um, DJ Slip did most of the production on all kinds of most one. Because that, cause that beat, that beat was hard. What I, well, basically, I found the record because, like I said, I used to be a neighborhood dude, low riders and old school and shit like that. So we always played that type of music. You know, we always played the fucking Marvin Gaye's, the Parliament, right, right. Roger, the Zap, whatever. So that was a record called Sugar Free. Oh, I am to me. Yeah. And we, I used to bump that record all the time, just on the strength. Right. I bought the 12 inch from the record store and used to just play it. So at the time when it was time for us to start recording, I used to bring shit to the table like that. I used to go, hey, we should wrap off of this. Yeah. Or we should wrap off of that. So I would bring slip records and go, hey, sample this. And basically, that's how we came up with this, the Compton thing. Because I went and bought the record. Yeah. I brought it to the studio so Slip could hear it. When he heard it, we bought in the keyboard player, and they replayed it. Because back then, sampling was a big thing. Right. And, you know, uh, uh, publishing companies wanted five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for you to sample right, one of their right. And they didn't, they didn't give a fuck if it was a half of a second. They wanted because that was a way for the old school artists to feel like, hey, my shit might have been do good back in the days, but now with this rap shit, right. it's a lot of dudes sampling our music. So it was a way for the older artists to get paid, you know, which I don't, I, I, I didn't have a problem with because if you're going to take somebody else's creation and create something out of it, basically, I, I feel like, fuck it, you got to get them credit props and pay them right. a little something because. You're getting your idea from that, straight up. It's funny you say that because we had Mims. Remember, remember Mims. This is why I'm hot. We had him on the show yesterday, and he used uh, he used E40 sample. He used Mob Deep sample. Uh, he used Kanye West sample, and he used uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop sample. And he said that he paid him out so much money for using those songs, those samples, that he said there wasn't no money left for him. So it's funny that you you bring that up. So samples is sample oh, yeah, because sample sample clearances cost you like a motherfucker. Like I said, one sample clearance could cost you anywhere between five and ten grand. Damn. So it was it was very it was real important when we were doing records that we would not sample a lot. It was a very or we would or we would find records that were just so like off the table and charts that you wouldn't re recognize it because Slip used to cut up shit so good. But we tried to stay away from sampling well-known songs. You know, Parliament shit, Rod right. Rapp shit, right. you know, George Clinton shit. Right. We tried to stay away from that because, yeah. That's what Dre was doing. Dre, Dre was using all that. <laughs> yeah, Dre didn't give a fuck because, like I said, <laughs> when you got... When you have the power of Interscope Records behind you and money, then fuck it. We can go pay a motherfucker ten grand for that sample, and then because it's gonna be greater later, you know, dudes like me, a lot of record companies didn't like to pay for a lot of that shit. So you have right. to keep that shit down, right? Because basically, it came out of your budget, right? So if you wanted to keep some money and you wanted to pocket you some bread. Then you learn how to do all your own production, or you hired a nigga who didn't who knew how to play the keyboards and who could replay shit. Right. That way, you can replay the motherfucker, and then they couldn't claim it because you would be like, "I didn't sample that; I replayed it." Speaking, so the cost would come way down. Speaking of pianos, who was that nigga that played the piano on "Thugging It Up"? <laughs> he killed that shit. <laughs> Willie, 
Oh, his name William Zimmerman. Oh, he was a he that was, was a, cold. He was a band dude. He used to play in the band for Chucky e. Booker. He used to play for Janet Jackson on tour, whatever, whatever. So he was a real skilled keyboard player. And basically, uh, when I when like I said, when I would find records and say I wanted to rap over them, slipping them would go out and find studio musicians to replay shit. That's what's up. And uh, they just happened to know with they just happened to know Willie Z. I always shouted him out on my records back in the days. Willie Z. Uh, Willie Z used to play everything. Willie, I could Willie could come over to my house and I could hum shit in his ear, and twenty minutes later, it's it's on the track. That's what's up. It. That's how gifted he was. Now let's switch gears, man. Let's go to going out like G's because that's a song that you drive by too. That's the song you play to do the drive by. Going out like G's, eight man. That is just so hard, man. What was what was your frame of mind on going out like G's, man? That shit hard as fuck. Well, basically, um, we come strapped was basically a record to where I had a lot of control myself as what basically the music I picked and what I wanted to rap about. Uh, Compton uh, in the house. I just wanted to basically tell a, a tale of growing up in the hood, you know, from from one aspect to another. And then it was it was me fucking taking my hand at being a production, being an executive producer, you know, working with half bounce with Slip and creating my own type of beats and music. So with going out like G's, it was basically at a time where you know. It was it was high profile bullshit going on in the neighborhoods. Like I said, it was a lot of struggling. It was a lot of motherfucking gang banging and drive bys and like we've always dealt with police harassment and, and racial profiling with the police and all that. So going out like G's was just basically a tale from the neighborhood. You know, one of those scenarios where I knew somebody or we had to deal with police on a daily basis. So it was like the negative outcome of getting harassed by the police. And that was the outcome. If we going to go out, then we going to go out like G's because it don't seem like there's no tomorrow in the situation that we've been put in. Yeah. So that's how I came up with that song. Like like Queen Latifah did and set it off, man. She went out like a G in that, in that last scene. <laughs> when she... Exactly. <laughs> but you know what that, that beat... That was basically my my concept for the song. Like, if you don't have to go out, then you might as well go out the right way and go out like a chick. That be them niggas that be like, I ain't going back to jail, nigga. You know, <laughs> exactly. I ain't going exactly. back. I, Look, they gonna have to carry me out of this bitch. Um, but but the beat was the beat was hard as fuck, man. Who who, who done that beat? I produced. Me and Slick produced that beat. Oh like, man, uh, good job, man. I that was, shit was hard. I, I was trying I was trying my hand at production and like I said, I would just sit up and hum beats to myself. I used to carry a tape recorder around, a little pocket mini tape recorder, newspaper dudes use. Right. And I could be I would be we would be on tour, getting on the airplane or whatever, and beats like bass lines would just come into my head. It it, it I do it to this day. I could be laying in my bed at home and a bass line would come in my head. So what I would do is I would carry the tape recorder around and any time a, a bass line came in my head, I would hit record and just start humming it into the tape recorder. And going out like G's was one of them songs. I, you know, we was traveling up late night on the tour bus, getting high, and I have my tape recorder and I'm sitting there and next thing you know, the bass line came into my head. Do, 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 do. So I grabbed the tape recorder and I just kept humming doom, doom, do, do, into the tape recorder. And then I took it back to the studio and I let Willie D hear it. And that's what we came up with. That that 808 was ridiculous. <laughs> that, that 808, that 808 on that song was just ridiculous, man. I was, it used to just rattle my trunk, man. Like, what? Play it and again. Then, Play it again. That's how, that's how. That's how me and DJ Slip work, because I would, I would start the shit at home, 
and I would put a basic beat on it and let Willie D come over and play. And then I would take it to the studio, let Slip hear it, give it to him, and then give him the floppy disk, and then come back a week later, and he he had he would put it all together: the 808s, the drum, the drops, the you know all that. You know, Genius it was a masterpiece at that. Genius, genius. Let's talk about nothing but the gangster man, because you, I gotta know what that studio set. Were, were you? What were all three of you guys in the studio? Method Man, I mean Red Man and uh, Spice One. Was everybody in the studio? Uh, me and me and Red Man was in the studio together, and I think I sent the song to Spice, and he recorded his verse and sent the tape back. Because back then we were still recording on uh, two inch master reels, so if I'm if I'm not mistaken, Spice laid his verse. I got the master reels back, and then uh, Red just happened to be in town that weekend, and I hit him up, and he came straight up to the studio, and the rest is history. That nigga said, "Oh my God, I destroy cities like the Blob, man, man." That was that verse was. That verse was so hard, man. We still be saying that shit. Oh yeah, <laughs> Red, Red, Red is one of them dudes that you knew like he he this motherfucker can rap. Right. You get me? Oh yeah. Like there's certain there's certain dudes who make songs and you know you respect the song or whatever, but Red was one of them dudes like Cube. You know this motherfucker can rap. Right. You get me? So yeah. Listen, man, I heard Once Upon a Time. Oh, that's dope, eight. <laughs> that motherfucker's dope, man. Once Upon a Time. Chicken while I'm moving yes, through traffic. The project official. I just dropped that project maybe about four months ago. Um, the double album on that one. I just be dropping shit like this. My thing is, I got a lot of producers that I fuck with. You know, a lot of dudes are up and comers, but. Because they're up and comers, nobody really fuck with them. So when I give a nigga like that a shot, they just send me tons and tons and tons of music. So I'm the type of motherfucker like your, your grandmama say, you going to eat everything on your <laughs> right, right, whatever. Right. So when niggas send me beats, if they are recordable, I record to them. I don't give a fuck. I just record to it. I write a song, I record. Write a song, record. You looked up, I got 50, 60 songs recorded. Oh. So what I do from there is I start going, okay, knowing I'm not going to put out 50 songs, I need to break this down to about 30 songs. So I break the 50 down to 30, and then out of the 30, I'll go, okay, what song is whatever. And then niggas will listen, and niggas will go, oh, I like that one. I like that. I like that. And when you look up, you got 27 songs that niggas like. So from there, I can say, well, fuck it. I'm my own lady. I'm independent. I run my own shit. I'm going to put them all out. Fuck it. Mm. Now, 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 so once, once, once upon a time, that was heavy piano, too. Who was that on that piano? That's a new cat that I fuck with. And, a, and and the funny shit about it is a lot of cats that I fuck with now, uh, a lot of them are overseas that do music. But what it is is that they've been trying to craft their shit so well. And I like fucking with up-and-coming producers who know me because they'll just go back, listen to my history or listen to music I put out. And they'll automatically send me 10 to 15 beats of shit that I will release. You get me? So when I get when I from there, I'll just go, man, just keep sending shit. So they 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 so hungry and you don't have to fight with a nigga about hey, you know, a motherfucker wanna play you something but then don't wanna give it to you because they trying to save that for the next Drake record. Right, next, right. You know, whatever. So I fuck with a lot of up and comers because they don't discriminate and they ain't got no time to wait. You get me? I need my shit out right now. I need it to be heard. And you a person with significant, substantial status. So you rapping on one of my beats only promotes me and gets me more juice. So I deal with niggas like that. Let me ask you a question. Um, when 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 the East Coast West Coast battle shit was going on, what was what was what was eight doing? 
I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't a part of that shit because, like I said, to this day, I'm cool with Premier on the East Coast. To this day, I'm cool with a gang of niggas out of the East Coast that rap Havoc, uh, Buster Rhymes, uh, Dave East, fucking the new niggas, the Griselda boys. Right. You know, I'm I'm so cool, and I've been cool with East Coast niggas for so long. I didn't get involved with that. I didn't get involved with that East Coast, West Coast beach. But to me, it wasn't That's even an up. East Coast, West To me, it wasn't even an East Coast, West Coast beach. It was a bad boy death row beach. Right. And a few niggas that wanted to latch along because they wanted to feel like, oh, this is Cali or this is New York. But for the most part, a lot of niggas was like, Ain't no East Coast, West Coast beef. That's them two motherfuckers that got beef with each other. Right, but, right. Be- but because they were so large entities of representing East Coast and West Coast music, people tried to make it like it's Cali versus New York when it was never like that. It right. was never. Suge didn't like Puff. Puff didn't like Suge or whatever. The, whatever. Pac and Big had they scenario. And so from there... You had everybody associated with them to want to ride the wave, so to speak. You get me? Right. I mean, it's on, mm-hmm. it's only natural. But see, I was my own entity. Compton's Most Wanted was never a part of anyone's crew. We was our own crew. We didn't come from Dre or Easy. We didn't come from Cube. We didn't come from Snoop and them and Death Row. We was our own motherfuckers, so we didn't get involved with that. Did you? Did, you know, did, like, like, like my nigga YG said, he's the only rapper who made it out the West without Dre. We mm. never got any. We never got any assistance from Dre or Q or Snoop or Easy. MC8 and Compton's Most Wanted came up on their own. It was me, Shield, DJ Snip. And that was it. We didn't we we didn't ride off the coattails of any other major celebrity. And so and so Death Row and, and y'all never had nothing. Death Row and 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 uh, and and y'all camp never had any issues. I didn't have. We didn't have any issues. But Quick was a part of the Death Row camp at one time. So if you want to say that was a little part of it, but Quick was Quick was. He had started fucking with Suge later down the line, so me and him had already had our hip hop beat bullshit. But it didn't it didn't roll over into like, okay, since Quick is rolling with us now, it's death roll against Compton's most wanted. Right. We didn't I didn't go through that. I mean my mom lived right across the street from Suge. I used to see them every day. My mom stayed right across the street from Suge's mom, I mean. Same neighborhood. In his in the mob neighborhood, my mom lived right across the street from his mom. I used to see them every day. I mean, I didn't have a problem with shit. Never did. Never. So 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 you and Quick, it was just a neighborhood thing. It was just two two niggas successful, two niggas doing good and and I mean a lot of people tried to incorporate it as neighborhood shit. I mean, let's face it. Before rap came along, Compton was gangbang central. He was from Treetop. I was from Tragnew Park, Crips and Bloods. So it's going to be beef there, period, right. because I'm Cripping and he's Blood. Right. But now for the fact that I have a little celebrity status and he has a little celebrity status, it went from just two rapper niggas in Compton and it went to neighborhoods and sets and gang banging and Niggas getting hurt and fighting and jumping right. and all that shit because it was crip against blood, so to speak. Right, you right. You get me? Right. It wasn't necessarily MC8 against DJ Quick. It made the whole scenario of crip rapper and blood rapper, up, you know, it right, took right. it to another scale. Right. Had, had, <laughs> had, had anybody ever approached you about, about you and Quick doing a versus battle? Had anybody ever approached you about that? No. Okay. Okay. I just wondered. I just wondered because uh, it seemed like because they was trying to do Ja Rule and Fifty Cent. So I right, said, and I get it, but I look at it like I wouldn't do it because we try to uplift the city of Camp. Right. Right. And then I think, and even though we are mature enough now that you know we quick see each other, we talk, shake, smoke, 
everything's good. I don't think it would be a good look for the city because of what it stood for in our beast. You get me? Right, right. Our beast stood for cripping blood and gang banging and fuck your hood and fuck your hood. You know what I'm saying? It really didn't have nothing to do with music. Our, our beast really didn't have anything to do with music. It had to do with counting niggas who bang and from different sides right. of the street. Right, right. That's what our really beef was about. It had nothing to do with music. Because if it had, some, if it was just music, then it would have been that. But it was more than just music. Like I said, when niggas was getting killed and jumped and seriously injured and shot at and all that type of shit and threats about killing your families and all that type of book. It's more than just music shit. Right, right. Did you did you have a relationship with Tupac? Was you and Tupac cool? Me and Pac was cool. We did a couple of shows together, uh, you know, so he, I, he was cool. And Pac was originally supposed to be in Minister Society. So he used to be at the movie set almost every day, you know, when we did rehearsals and all that. So... Me and Pac was cool. We never had any beef. Like I said, we did a few shows together. You know, we always used to talk and chop it up, whatever. Uh, he had mentioned that when he was doing his time at Rikers, I was one of the records he used to bump, Compton's Most Wanted Music to Drive By. So we always had mutual respect for each other. Yeah, I seen a uh, I seen an interview with that, with Vlad that you done, and you was like Tupac went backwards on the gang banging stuff. I guess you were saying that people... Well, artists try to make it they make it and then start gang banging well something because i mean you know Pac was one of them outspoken dudes and he was one of those dudes who you know if this is what we doing and this is what we gonna do so for him that comes from new york and then oakland and then find his way to la where niggas is crippling and blood and you know he felt maybe he had an obligation to uh, Death Row and Suge and the homies who were set up with Death Row because they were all bloods and whatever. So I guess he felt an obligation because when you're hanging with dudes and every day you're hanging with these dudes and you're partying, you're watching each other back, you're smoking, you're drinking together, fucking bitches together, getting money together, it starts turning into like, you know, I'm feeling I have to show my loyalty too, right. because these niggas is playing in the neighborhood. Even though it's death row records, these niggas is playing in blood, my blood. So how do I show my appreciation and my loyalty? You know, because fuck some record shit. I want to show a nigga that I'm down and I'm loyal too. You know what? It seemed like the music. It seemed like the music industry was scared of Suge. Was was that the? What, did, did Compton feel that way? Was people in Compton scared of Suge? Uh, I mean, Suge was a, a saying. You know, we niggas in the real neighborhood situations don't really fear niggas because we don't have leaders and chiefs like that when it comes to our neighborhoods. So. I mean, Suge was a big figure to the world and the music business and the suit and tie people. But in Compton, he was like another nigga from the neighborhood. Yeah, he's a big ass nigga. He's a big <laughs> figure or whatever. Right. But to a nigga who's been through the same struggle, it's, it's, we don't, it's, it's never like an intimidation factor for niggas that feel like, nigga, we all come from the same place. You get me? Right. Now, your wallet might be bigger than mine, right? Because we all know that. But as far as the mentality and the mind state, man, I don't give a fuck. I'm right. a hood nigga too. Right. And I can quickly pull out my heat and blast right. the motherfucker just as quickly as you can. So that's where that that's where that mind state comes from when you come to Compton and you start talking now, yeah. You can mention some niggas and niggas would be like, oh, that, that motherfucker right there ain't no joke. Or oh, that nigga straight killer. You don't fuck with that nigga. If you do, you know it's going to be an issue. But ain't no nigga going to say, oh, no, I'm scared of that nigga. Nah, nigga, it's going to go down. Would a nigga beat the shit out of me and whatever, whatever? <laughs> Probably so. But 
I ain't gonna back down from a motherfucker. Right. That's the worst thing you can do. Now, now, at, at, at one point, Compton seemed like the worst place on earth, man. Has it has it got better, or or or, or was the reputation undeserved? I mean, what, is, is it? it was, I think that's just because we were so high profile, right? You, me? you got rappers and sports figures coming out of Compton. I mean, we were the gang banging place and whatever, whatever. And because of the popularity of what what Compton produced, that. It made it like the worst place on the planet at one time. Right. Oh man, you better not go to Compton. <laughs> oh, you know, E say this, and MC Eight and Compton's most wanted say this, and so and so say this, and then you see in the videos, niggas, is, you know, then they show on the news, niggas doing drive-bys and right, and right, niggas getting just so. If you're a motherfucker from out of town somewhere, and you coming from Ohio or Chicago or somewhere else. Motherfuckers gonna tell you in a minute. Your mama, your daddy, somebody gonna say, "Nigga, don't go to Compton." <laughs> you know, I I, 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 mean, I, I got a funny. Same, st- it's the same shit. It's the same shit when I used to go to Chicago, and niggas don't don't go to Fort Green Project. Right. Don't go to Cabrini Green. Right. Or don't go here. And I didn't give a fuck. I went because I felt I was a part of that. Right. But, Niggas tell you in a minute when you hop off the plane or when you get up to the corporate record company office and you got the motherfuckers up there with their suit and ties and, and okay, we're going to go on a promo tour and the motherfuckers are going, but we're not going to go over here. We're not going right. to go over there. And you're like, why not? Oh, you don't want to go over there. Oh, now you're going to make me want to go because I want to see what the fuck. Real niggas right. don't do that type of right. thing. <laughs> you you know what's funny? Uh, you know what's funny? I remember um, I'm, I'm a cowboy fan, and we had a convention. I went to this convention. I met this girl from Compton, and she told me she was from Compton. And I and I joked. I said, I said, I better not make you mad. You might do a drive by on me. That shit was funny. I said, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, everybody, everybody has that mentality at one time, right? You know, watch yourself if you ever go into L.A. and stay far from Compton. But like I said. We wasn't no different than if you went to Chicago or if you went to Cleveland or you went to New York to the Bronx or right. Brooklyn right. or you went to Philly or you went to Texas and went to Fifth or Third Ward right. or you went to Louisiana and went to Magnolia or Calio Project. We wasn't no different. We just had a bigger high profile right. and a camera on us because of the gang and the drug sales and the Bataram and Daryl Gates and the crippling and the blood, and, and right. then next thing you know, you're coming along with Ice T and Easy E and all these figures, you know. So and, we just had a bigger camera on us, and you know. And don't forget, but and don't forget MC Eight. Don't forget MC Eight with the with the double sticker too. <laughs> yeah, we had double stickers. And MCA had drive-by music, and I had videos, straight up minutes. And, yeah, you know, all everything was a negative outlook, but to us, it was great because hey. It was giving our city a shine and it right. was letting motherfuckers know what Compton was all about. You know, you, we, we couldn't even shoot videos and shit in the city because the mayor and the city officials thought that it would give Compton a bad look by seeing us walking through neighborhoods with gangbangers and showing that we in the city of Compton. So we would have to shoot our videos in L.A. or Hollywood or all that. Right. I think Easy was the first motherfucker that they let really do a video when he did Compton City G. Right. They let because he because he donated money to the city. That's how he was able to do that video. But up until then, they did not like you to come in Compton and shoot videos because they felt we were giving the city a bad name because of the music we were right. do. And then a lot of us were a lot of us were coming from neighborhoods. Right. Did you did, did you have a did, did you have a relationship with uh, Nipsey Hussle? I didn't have a relationship with Nipsey Hussle, but he was a dude I listened to from as far as back to when he first started coming out. Uh, I used to listen to all his mixtapes. You know, Snoop used to advocate for him a lot, so I used to listen to him. So I was a I was a true fan. You get me, right? Now let me ask you, uh, Big U. Everybody was on Big U head because Big U uh, told uh, 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 Big Boy, Big Boy's neighborhood. He told Big Boy that uh, that Nipsey wasn't a legend. It, it, is is Nipsey a legend? 
Did he do enough work to be a legend? I think he did enough work to... I think he did enough work to where he was accepted from people, even though it was in the demise of his passing, that he did enough work and he did enough positive outreaching to where you can't take that from him. You get me? Because right. he motivated a lot of niggas to do they hustle different. And anytime you can have a nigga come along and motivate you to make your hustle count and make it stand for something, then to a lot of niggas and a lot of fans, he's gonna be considered a legend. You get me? Okay. Because he's able to he's able to do what a lot of niggas could have done but didn't do. Right. You feel me? Right. And he came along and his vision was that sole purpose. To motivate, educate, and inspire a nigga to go further than he thinks he can go. Now we've had a lot of big time rappers, but nobody gave that message right. that he was trying to because he was a nigga in the street streets. You get me? Like a lot of us who made it successful the move the way and you know whatever but he stayed right in the in the struggle and start establishing my t-shirt shop my restaurant my center my everything i'm gonna be right here in the thick of it and a lot of the shit i do is gonna be around here not to say that a lot of us couldn't do it but a lot of us got put in situations to where it's hard to try to go back and do because a lot of motherfuckers don't like you, whatever. They're still stuck in the hate, whatever. Right. Missy was a nigga who started right there and said, fuck that. Instead of putting me a store over here, I'm going to put it right around the corner from where I was hustling and banging at. Right. Instead of going over there, I'm going to put it right here while I'm still coming at it. Like, like the aspect, like I said, when I first started rapping, I wanted to be in the neighborhood every day. I didn't want to be in the in the hills or at the fancy restaurant right. or over here doing inner. I wanted to be on the block every day. Right. And that was him. He still wanted to represent his neighborhood, even though I'm going to get corporate with these motherfuckers right. and I'm going to put on a suit and tie. I'm still going back to the hood when I get done. You feel me? That's so what's up. He had, that, he had that respect from a lot of niggas, crips, bloods, hustlers. And when you get that and everybody from different sides of the fence are able to shake your hand and pat you on the back and congratulate you, then, yeah, you're going to be a legend in a lot of niggas' eyes. I agree. I agree. That's why I got a, I got a painting of him in my man cave right behind me, man. I thought I thought that much of him that that uh, that I uh, had a, a painting, you know, drawn of him. To put in my man cave, man, and everybody love it, man. So that's what's up. Let me ask you. You know what? I was on your Instagram page. I see your son play football. He a he a football prospect, man. You want to talk about how how sweet your son is? My son just turned sixteen. Goddamn sixteen year old nigga. You know these kids, man. You you. I, I try to just you know me growing up and not having a lot of opportunities as a kid. You know. I just wanted to be able to make that available for him. You know, my father wasn't around to participate in a lot of shit. You know, my mother was a single parent, hardworking. After my after my parents got divorced, it was just her and me and my sister and brother. So it was a lot of struggle for her working and doing all that. So I didn't get to do a lot of the shit that I provide that he does. I didn't get to play sports or games. And, you know, I did it a little bit, but... And then my father's presence wasn't around that much. It was always my mom. So I wanted to instill that in him, that a father's presence is, is valuable, you know, right. in our situation right. where a lot of us young men or ended up with no fathers or going to prison or not having that guidance because I didn't. And that's why my shit, tried to, my shit started off a little rocky because... I didn't have that guidance because my father wasn't around. <laughs> he still intimidated me from afar. But let's face it, the older I got and you ain't around, motherfucker, that shit ain't working. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, the, that's me being involved with him to show him, oh, yeah, nigga, I, I give a fuck. Right. I care about where you end up 
and how you educated and what kind of job you got. And I'm going to give you the same opportunities that a lot of young black youth don't get. You know, you're going to go to a good school, a nice school. You're going to get to play sports. Oh, if Johnny got a thousand dollar helmet, fuck it. We're going to get you a thousand dollar Yeah. Helmet. Hell yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. If, 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 if they're over there training, oh, what? He's doing extra training. That cost this. Okay. Well, fuck it. You're going to get extra training too. That's what's so up. I'm trying to give him the same opportunities that a lot of our young black youth didn't get. Like I didn't get growing up. Right. You know, it was right. a struggle. Right. So. I try to be involved, and I try to get him, like I said, a lot of us don't have the guidance when we're young because the father figures ain't around. So I try to do that with him from the age he was three. Okay, motherfucker, we finna go play something. Right. <laughs> Some kind of organized sport. So, oh, you don't like that? Okay, next year, let's try this. Right. Okay, next year, let's try this. Let's, you know, and then he picked up on football. He started playing football when he was five. He's 16 now. He's been playing it every year since he was five. So it stuck with him. And that's what I wanted to do. Yep. Give him something that he could be interested in to where when he start getting older and thinking he's whatever, you have something that you, 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 you know, you can go to college. You right. get free education. Shit, motherfucker, you can go play college football. Shit, if you get enough, you might be naked. So I wanted to give him that and put something in him than you know, just sitting around letting him play video games and hanging out and becoming one of these statistics. Right. You feel me? Right. That, that's what's up, man. That's 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 what's up, man. You get you get you get kudos for that. One, one more thing, one more thing. I want to ask you about the uh, the growing up in the hood remix. Mike DJ Mike T done the growing up in the hood remix. Was that was that approved? Yes, sir. Was that approved? Oh, oh, definitely. The Mike T. Uh, DJ Mike T, um, he's been a part of Top is more, most wanted for forever. And growing up in the hood, he was the number one boys in the hood movie. It was the number one single in the country, whatever. So, growing up in the hood was actually owned by Warner Brothers and Warner, Warner Brothers Music. Because the movie came out through... Warner Brothers, the soundtrack was on Quest. So actually, Boys in the Hood was owned by Warner Brothers. Sony gave them permission for me to do the song. But because it was so successful, Sony wanted them a version of For Themselves. So that's when my key was capped to, well, my key knew we had to remix the record. Because that's something that labels did in my day. You automatically, if the record was hot, they wanted you to remix it. Right. So, Slip was supposed to do the remix, and I think one night, you know, because Mike T was getting his hand into production. So, Mike T came to the studio with the floppy disc, and he said, listen to this. And he had chopped up the more bounce on... uh so I think he gave it to the added the eight oh eight and all that shit. And then there you go. We came up with the growing up in the hood remix. Oh, that is so dope. Version. So dope. I play it all the time. Which is which is probably which is my favorite version. Yeah. I like the original, but I like the more bounce version. Hell yeah. Because it's to me it's more it got that more neighborhood. Hell yeah. It go like I, I DJ I DJ tailgates. I you know, like tailgates, okay. man. And we talking three, four, four, five hundred people and and that's that's a favorite, man. That's a favorite right there. Oh yeah. You, <laughs> you can't go wrong man, you can't go wrong when you put on more bounce. Man. No, you hell no. Wrong. No, you can't so do brother, that. Uh, one thing before we go, uh how you feel? You know, dispel all those rumors about coronavirus. Yeah, I know you was hot oh, no, for a while. Yeah, I was hospitalized. I, I never had coronavirus. Uh, I've been dealing with, like, internal uh, stomach issues for a long time, man. And that goes way back to being a young nigga in the hood and drinking like he was 80 years old. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I didn't have corona. Um, I, had a, I have a thing called pancreatitis is what I have. So uh, every now and then my stomach just, you know, it gets to a point to where it's like, hey, I'm not happy with you today. And mm -hmm. the, the only thing that saves it 
is I have to go to the hospital three or four days. Oh, they gotta okay. hook me up to IVs and give me all kind of shit, and that's the only thing that brings it back to normal. So, okay, wow. I, I've been dealing. I've been dealing with that shit for about the last. 15 years. Oh, okay. So, okay. Oh. Well, well, we hope that yeah. every, everything work out with that. Um, you, okay, besides the uh the Blue Stamp official, I mean, you got anything else? You working on anything else? Got anything coming up? Blue Stamp official. I got the new single that's dropping this week with uh with my man Conway the Machine and DJ Premier. Yep, I got so it. Called Hancho. Yep, I got it. Okay. So Han Hancho is going to come out. The video will be dropping in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's leading up to my forthcoming album, which is Lessons. Lessons is the new record I'm going to drop next month. We're trying to figure out a date right now because everybody's dropping. Nas is going to drop this week. Uh, oh. You know, Buster, Rock, Buster Rhymes is getting ready to drop in a couple of weeks. So we're just trying to plan it out so, you know, we don't run no interference. But I got Lessons dropping. You know, I got a star study cast on it. Uh, uh, Conway the Machine is on it. Uh, DJ Premier is on it. Dave East is on it. Uh, Tali Kwali is on it. Uh, Be Real, Noble from the Outlaws, Yuck Mouth, uh, Nick Yo. Slick, Yo. Uh, fucking uh, uh, Cocaine, uh, Corrupt, Havoc from My Deep. Uh, you know, so it, it's it's a good record. It's cocaine, that's our dude. That's our dude, man. We had cocaine on the show about a month ago, about two months ago, about two months ago. We had him on here. Okay. Um, you I know, got cocaine on the song, so it's twenty songs on this record. So it's it, it, it's it's official. I seen you on the page with uh, Tyrese. Tyrese not gonna be on there. Tyrese, me and Tyrese is in talks about something else. Tyrese is trying to work on a. Tyrese is trying to work on a movie. So that's why I was having a meeting with Tyrese because he got some ideas that he wanted to toss around to me and see if I was down with. So we had a we had a meeting and shit, and you know everything went good, and we try we trying to put together something. So that's what that's what I was doing with Tyrese. Now I see a lot of the I see a lot of the West Coast artists. They fucking with uh hip hop Harry man. Are are, are you fucking with hip hop Harry? Hip hop hair. It's it's this little like Chuck E. Cheese dude. Hip hop Harry. Oh no, no. I seen that shit. I don't, I don't, I ain't, I ain't fucking with him. I ain't fucking with hip hop hair. I need that to the most. I'm trying to promotionalize that shit. Who needs sponsorship and who else? I'm, I'm cool. I don't need to go fucking with hip hop hair. So we ain't. So, so we ain't gonna see a hip hop Harry. All right, all right. The goof. Oh, that's what Greg, I can't believe up. you asking that. No, Snoop, Snoop, fucking with him. Money B, fucking with him. I mean, come on, what you know? I'm, 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 I ain't fucking with hip hop hair. <laughs> <laughs> I leave that to the goofy shit, man. I, 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 let me tell you something. I've worked too hard in this business to establish true hip hop to fuck around with gimmicks. That's what you, I. You gonna fuck around and get three stickers with with, with a hip hop Harry? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. That shit. Hey, hey, well, check this out, hey, man. Thanks for joining us, man. I really appreciate it, man. You one of the real ones still in the game, man. And and uh, go ahead and give out your uh, social media handles how everybody can get a hold of you. Man, you can hit me on Facebook at 8 Compton. You can hit me on Twitter at 8 Compton. And you can hit me on motherfucking uh, Instagram, 8 Compton or 808. Uh, that like I said, the brand, new, the brand new record is coming. Lessons, the single is dropping. And killed in. If you want to hear some bad shit, some good shit, go bump that official double album, twenty seven cuts, and that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. Once upon a time, that's that track. Well, hey, th thanks a lot, man. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot again, man. And take care, man. You be careful out there. For sure, man. Y'all stay up, man. All right, one, man, thank one. You for, in the time, for sure, y'all stay up. All right, man. That was dope, wasn't it? That was dope, man.
Man, he put in more time than he uh, planned to. Well, I had a lot because, uh, like I told you going in, man, this is this was one of my favorite interviews to do. I really looked forward to it. Uh, this was a dude I really I really rock with him, man. I mean, when I was growing up, I really I bumped his shit all the time. I had all the albums, knew all of the words. I was running around saying Gia <laughs> to everybody. I remember I remember I said Gia one time, and my mama smacked me in the mouth because I wasn't answering her right. I said Gia. She said, boy, you better answer me right. And I said it again, and she popped my ass. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, man. So, this was uh, – and, and then you can ask my co-host, man. My co-host, I ran it about getting him, man. I was I was pressing about getting eight on the show, man. And no. – uh, but – and 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 you know what I feel, I feel I feel the same about Spice One and then we got him up but I had DJ for Spice One I had been around Spice One before I had been around Eight before and you know Eight always mm-hmm. Eight always come over to Detroit and do concerts and my dude in Detroit who do the concerts he always brings us backstage so so I didn't hung out with Eight before I didn't out hung out with Eight a couple times and uh, I remember I one I remember um I remember one time backstage I was taking pictures and uh, and him and his manager. Had me had me go around. I was taking pictures of them and everybody that was backstage, man. So so I already didn't fuck with him before, but but I never got an opportunity to like talk to him. You know what I'm saying? So so that was a that was a good look for me. I got ready for it. I had a lot of questions and I asked them, and I think I I got them all off. I got them all off, man. So we good, you know. Yeah, um, that that interview was what's up, man. That, that, that really was. That was a treat there. Yeah, that was, man. So, uh, yeah. uh, let me. Well, let me. Uh, let me see here. Um, uh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, we got uh, we got Ezel from Fridays, man. I'm looking forward to that too. I'm gonna have some fun with him. Yeah, and, he, yeah, that's gonna be a funny and we, day. That's and we're gonna see if he fuck with hip hop Harry. <laughs> do Do you know? Do you do you know who hip hop Harry is? Do you know? No, he sound no. I don't. Ask, do you see any of your kids in there? Ask, ask your kids. You know who uh, Hip Hop Harry is? What am I? <laughs> they, yeah, they know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Hey, go, 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 go. Hip Hop Harry. <laughs> hey, hey. He's for kids, she's there. Huh? My daughter said he's the kids. Yeah, no, but listen, the, the adults fucking with him, man. That's why I asked Eight about him. Eight was like, I ain't fucking with him, Bob Harry. <laughs> yeah, he, I, man, wow. Now you put it in now. My daughter put it in perspective that he like the hip hop version of Barney. Or, you ask Eight if he fuck with him. No, because oh, Snoop. Man. Listen, all of the listen, all of the gangster rappers. Snoop. Snoop done a video with him. Money B, who I just talked to earlier today, Bunny B, uh, yeah. M- Money B doing an event with him. So I'm like, everybody, all these gangster rappers fucking with Harry Hip Hop here. He based, he like a, he like a Chuck E. Cheese. That's what he look like. He he's a a rabbit or a rap. I think he's a bunny. A bear, eh? What's that? I, I think he a bunny because they call him Hip Hop Harry. I don't know. But anyway, um. Uh, just wanted to r- remind everybody that uh, we got uh, uh, Ezel from Fridays on tomorrow's show. Uh, on Wednesday, we got uh, the group 112 from uh, from Bad Boy. You know, Diddy, Notorious Big, Little yeah. Kim, Junior Mafia, all that. And then I on 112, I know 112, but I didn't know that was part of a that was a Diddy's project. Oh yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So yeah, I got a lot. I got a lot for them. And then on. Uh, is that cool about eight in an interview is that he and YG don't mind working across the blood and Crips line. You know, they'll work with each other. Oh, that's, that's old, that's Major. Cool. Major, that's old. They they been cross lines, man. They they cross lines back in like ninety five. I mean, no, they they been off of that. They been off of that, man. I mean, we talking almost thirty years now. Uh twenty five uh-huh. twenty five years. Twenty five years. They been off of that, man. They been off of that. Don't know. They don't. They don't do that blood crip ship no more over there, man. I mean, at least not on the entertainment level. But uh, you know, but the thing is, YG, you know, he's the only young, younger generation rapper that I've seen who would come across, and he will, you know, he worked with. Uh, he still claimed blood, you know, because that's the neighborhood yeah, he's he from. Claimed blood, but he worked with. Uh, he worked with. Uh, you know, so who was? Uh, I think at the time he was claiming claiming crip. Well, if and, you uh, if you seen the uh, last time that I checked video, the video 
Nipsey Hussle, it's him and Nipsey Hussle in the video. Nipsey Hussle was a crip. He had blood. One of them got on red. One of them got on blue. And half half of the room is blue. Half of the room is red. And they be right, walking. Right, and right. they. I saw that video. And they be walking back and forth on each other's side. Like it's all good, you know. So it's all good. So, so. But anyway, uh, Does that let me. Mean the war is over? Yeah, pretty much, man. I mean, they don't be tripping. I mean, not even in Toledo. They don't be. I ain't heard no blood. I ain't heard no cripping blood shit. Like like I mean like like drive by shootings or incidents. I ain't heard I ain't heard none in a while. So let me turn that mic on. That mic is just this tower. They're about making that money. Okay. Well, check this out. Let me find. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, until tomorrow. Well, let me let me remind you guys. Uh, go to uh Instagram. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Until tomorrow. Bam. We out of here. It's the Big Trap and Q Show. They waiting for just another damn podcast. Now let's go. Go, go, go. It's the Big Trav and Q Show. So what you gonna do, bro? Q is from D-Town. We chillin' in the Momo. Travis from the mud. We call it Glass City. Swoop some red bones. And they was acting shifty. It's the Big Ballin' Podcast.